Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 to 13. We shall spend all this morning on the first section of this sermon. Seeing the crowds, he, Jesus, went up into a mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. By some standards, the Sermon on the Mount is one of the shortest preached. By any standard, it is the greatest. And we are going to spend three mornings looking at this sermon. We shall have to travel quickly and may miss some of your favorite points in the sermon. You can put them in yourself. By way of introduction, look at the place, the people, and the purpose for which this sermon was preached. The place, why did Jesus go up into a mountain? To get away from the crowds? To have room for a multitude? To separate from the merely curious? Or perhaps to use one of God's pulpits? One of those hills to which we lift up our eyes for help? The hills of Olivet, of Carmel, of Sinai all come to mind as God's natural pulpits. And one cannot help drawing the contrast and making a comparison with Sinai and the revelation through Moses. Now a greater than Moses is here, whom Moses himself predicted, and about whom he said, whoever does not listen to that prophet will be destroyed from among the people. So much then for the place, one of God's pulpits. Who were the people to whom this sermon is addressed? A lot of scholars' ink has been spilled, over the question, is this for disciples or for everyone? The answer is that he began with his disciples and he finished with a multitude. And I'm presuming, therefore, that this sermon is primarily for those committed to Christ, but that he didn't mind those who were not so committed overhearing the conditions of discipleship. And I have found that this sermon has a double value in preaching. It not only helps disciples to realize what they ought to be, it warns would-be disciples about the conditions under which they are called to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It's for both. The purpose of the sermon is obviously a very serious one. This is obvious from the fact that Jesus sat down and the fact that he opened his mouth. God doesn't waste words. And if God tells us these things, they are important. Our Lord is speaking ex cathedra. He sat down. And when a rabbi sat down, he was going to speak the word of God. And so here is our Lord speaking ex cathedra from his seat. It is also serious because he opened his mouth. Now, obviously, you've got to do that to speak. But whenever that phrase is used, it seems to underline, listen very carefully to what is going to be said. There is a kind of deliberate approach to the sermon. He sat down, he opened his mouth, and he taught them. Now there are those who feel that in the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord was telling us how to work for our salvation. And that this sermon belongs to a very limited period of history. 
in which salvation by works was being offered to the Jewish people. I cannot stop now to argue that one except to say that I think there is a misunderstanding. This is not how to work for your salvation but how to work out your salvation. It's working, yes, but not working for, but working out. Working out what God has worked in. For Christianity is concerned with behavior as well as belief, with conduct as well as creed, with consecration as well as conversion, with how you go on as well as with how you start. I think it's Matthew Henry who says that this sermon is not so much concerned with the credenta of the Christian faith as with the agenda, what needs to be done. And here we have the working out of salvation. Now let it work. And this is how it should work. Now we approach the first section of the sermon. And we notice that the sermon begins with character before it deals with conduct and that is quite deliberate and of far-seeing importance. The Christian life is first of all what you are before ever it becomes what you do, and that is precisely the opposite notion to the one most widely held among unbelievers. Ask an unbeliever what a Christian is and he will answer in terms of what you do, being kind to grandmother and the cat, trying not to do anybody any harm, leaving the world a little better than you find it, all in terms of doing. Christ teaches us that Christianity is first of all what we are, and what we do will be the fruit of what we are. Conduct will spring from character. It's much more important to be a Christian than to do things that Christian, Christians do. The one follows from the other. And so our Lord begins with being a Christian and therefore the opposite of the world's notion as to how you begin. Now there has been argument as to whether the Beatitudes are in chronological order. You begin by being poor in spirit and you finish up by being persecuted. Now it is true, it is true that there are certain progressive ideas in the Beatitudes but I have put a little phrase on your outline, beginning and continuing. I have the feeling that these attitudes, these attributes of Christian character, these ingredients of the recipe for a Christian disciple, are in fact attributes which are needed all the way along. And we are not to regard any of them as belonging to the earlier stages, or any of them as belonging to the later they are continuing as well as beginning. And so we turn to what Billy Graham has called the beautiful attitudes, <laughs> which is quite a useful definition. And we begin by looking at the meaning of the word blessed. By the way, I don't know if you noticed that, but when you read it, do read blessed. Blessed is a very old-fashioned way of saying the word. It's blessed. Oh, how blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, what does Jesus mean? It's obvious that the word means basically happy. Still to this day, Greek children are often called makarios. As you might call a little girl joy, so little boys are still called makarios, and I'm sure you know of at least one gentleman of that name. <laughs> and his parents called him happy, makarios. Every photograph I've seen has rather belied his name. But then I think it's the triumph of hope over experience to call any child a name of character. We called our third Angela or Angel. I'm afraid it hasn't worked. <laughs> now, not only does the word makarios or blessed mean happy, it means more than happy. It means to be in a happy place or position. It means to have within itself all the conditions needed for true happiness. The very name Cyprus means happy isle because of its fertility. The early settlers believed it contained all that was necessary within itself to be truly happy. And the word blessed means a person 
who has within himself all that is necessary to true happiness. But the word blessed means even more than that. It's a term of congratulation. And following the example of our speaker last night, may, be, may I be a little Greek and point out that the verb are is not included in the original. It isn't blessed are the poor in spirit, it's blessed the poor in spirit. It's a term of congratulation. It is a statement. We could translate it, oh the happy position of the poor in spirit. And we've got right into our subject. Now here is the interesting thing. Here is our Lord's answer to the question, who is best off in life? Or what is the life that is most worth living? And his answer is quite different from the answers of many of the great philosophers of history. There are three basic answers to this question. Some say the answer is to be found in what you have. You're in a really happy position according to what you have, whether it's wealth or health or friends or faculties, whatever it may be. A second category of answer to this question is that the real life worth living is to be found in terms of what you do. If you have many hobbies or interests, if you've traveled widely, if you have cultural activities, then you will be in a happy position. But our Lord's answer to the life most worth living is not in terms of what I have, not in terms of what I do, but in terms of what I am. Here is the real secret. For the real world in which I live is not the world outside, but the world inside. I came to a conference here in Swanwick about 14 years ago and I suffered from violent toothache the whole conference and finally had it pulled out rather roughly in a little back room down the road in Ripley after two days of sheer misery. Now it was weather like this. The speakers were great. The fellowship was wonderful. But the real world I lived in was the world inside. <laughs> and I was not in a happy position even though I was among Christians and in Swanwick and enjoying perfect weather. Just multiply that by spiritual dimension and you've got the meaning of the Beatitudes. The real world in which you live is the world inside. And the happiest position is the position of a life that's right inside, that has the ingredients of Christian character. And to these we now turn. The first is the key to the rest and in a sense is the fundamental first step of the Christian life, though it's a continuing as well as a beginning attribute. It does not say, blessed are the poor spirited. Christians are not called to be sissies and namby-pambies who wouldn't hurt a fly with neither backbone nor stuffing. That is not the beatitude. Nor does it say, blessed are the spiritually poor. There is no blessedness in a poverty-stricken prayer life, in a poor understanding of the Bible. There is nothing blessed in half-hearted worship. There is nothing blessed about being spiritually poor. What then does it mean? The word poor is a relative term. We use it in Britain, but we don't use it in the same sense in which they use it in China. In Britain, it means someone who hasn't got everything that we think is necessary to life. It means someone who is deficient in the things that they need. But that is not the meaning on our Lord's lips. Taking it a stage lower down, it means not only someone who is deficient, who hasn't got everything they need, but someone who is destitute, someone who has nothing. That's one step further down. That's to be really poor. But there's a step lower still, and that is someone who's got worse than nothing, who's up to their eyes in debt. Charles Dickens and his portrait of debtors' prisons in Pickwick Papers reminds us that the word poor in Britain not many years ago meant someone who had less than nothing 
and who was up to their eyes in debt with no hope of ever getting out of it. And that is the meaning of the word poor in scripture. As a study of the prophet Amos reveals straight away. Now it is this situation of being so utterly poor that you not only have nothing yourself, you have less than nothing, you are so much in debt that you will never get out of debt. Apply that to the spirit and you've got the meaning. It is someone whose pride has been progressively destroyed by poverty. If you have less than everything you need, your pride will lead you to struggle to maintain your existence. Have you ever tried to help an old age pensioner? If you have absolutely nothing, you, your pride might lead you to starve rather than beg. But if you are a debtor, your pride is completely swallowed and you are ready to accept charity from anyone who will help you out of your impossible situation. You've got to swallow every bit of pride you've got and throw yourself on the mercy of someone who is charitable toward you. To be poor in spirit before God is to realize not only that I haven't everything that I need, not only that I have nothing that I need, but that I am up to my eyes in debt and there is no way out of the situation except by throwing myself on the charity of God. Martin Luther said we are all beggars and that is the beatitude. George Bernard Shaw said forgiveness is a beggar's refuge we must pay our debts like men. I fear that he is now paying his debts. You either come to God as a beggar or you come not at all. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now a, fr a friend of mine is a minister in London and a man came to him one day and said this he said, do you mean to tell me that I must come before God with open hands and outstretched arms and confess that my life is a failure and that I can't do anything without him? I'm damned if I will, said this man. The minister rightly replied, you're damned if you won't. It is this pride in us that will not come poor in spirit. But when I read the words and the lives of the saints, they were people who were beggars. They were people who were utterly humbled. Listen to Charles Wesley. If so poor a worm as I. Listen to Isaac Watts. A wretched, poor and helpless worm. On William Carey's tombstone, a worm. Poor in spirit. And it's those who have found that the kingdom of heaven flings its gates wide open to beggars and to no one else. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I come to number two. <coughs> Dear me, the time is... Have we a clock in here? No, we haven't. <laughs> <laughs> number two. Those who mourn over sin. Now there is a paradox enshrined in this beatitude. Oh, how happy are the unhappy. Isn't that an extraordinary thing to say? Never man spake like this man. Oh, how happy the unhappy. And the word mourns means to be overcome with grief, to agonize, to ache in heart, to have tears coursing down one's cheek. Oh, how happy are the unhappy. Now, there are two mistaken views about the Christian life that I come across. Number one, Christians must never be happy. It's not so long ago since a, a Scotsman, due apologies, sir, was brought before the elders of his church for smiling on the Sabbath. Those days are fortunately gone. But there are still some who think that every time we have a service we ought to have a funeral <coughs> and that we ought to dress as if we're going to a funeral. This is one idea that Christians must never be happy. But this beatitude does not say blessed are the moody or blessed are the morose or blessed are the miserable, it says blessed are the mourning. The other opposite idea, which is equally mistaken, is that Christians must always be happy. 
And we all know the cheerleader who goes around. Now, come on, it's raining outside, but we're great inside. Clap hands and let's get going. The kind of cheerleader approach to the Christian faith. I don't think a Christian must always be happy. We follow a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And there are times when a Christian will mourn. And blessed are those times. Now let's say straight away it does not mean bereavement. I'm afraid I don't feel that this verse ought to be read at funerals. I don't think it refers to that kind of mourning. Nor does it refer to that weeping that comes from sympathy with sufferers. Mourning for others. This is essentially the godly grief that produces repentance towards God and carries no regret. The world tries to laugh it off, to make a joke about sin and to laugh it off, but that will bring regret. Godly grief does not try and laugh it off, but it faces seriously the sin of our own hearts, and it mourns over that sin. I don't make this a generalized rule, but I have noticed that where there have been tears at a conversion, there is a lasting conversion. And where there has been a genuine weeping over sin, there is cleansing and healing in those tears. That is not to say that we must work up weeping or must expect it or stimulate it. I'm just making an observation. If you've never wept for yourself, I wonder if you will know the blessedness about which our Lord speaks here when you consider the opportunities you've wasted, the spirit you've grieved, the people you've hurt, is that not enough to make you weep? It ought to be. And the glorious promise is that those who weep like that will be comforted. Now this word is so misunderstood. Our minister never preaches comforting sermons. Have you heard that or said it? Now what they mean is he never preaches coddling sermons or cotton wool sermons. But the word comfort has in the middle of it the word fort. I've put it in capital letters for you. It means to put strength into you. It means to garrison you. It means to make you strong. In the Bayer tapestry, that um, embroidered comic strip of William the Conqueror, there is a picture, one of the scenes, and it shows a battle in progress and it says Bishop Odin comforts his troops. And do you know what he's doing to them? They are there in a line facing the enemy and he is standing behind them with a sword and he is prodding them in the behind. <laughs> he's stirring them into battle. He's pushing them on. He's strengthening them to fight the enemy. Now that's not many people's idea of comfort. But frankly, when people in a congregation look as if they're sitting on drawing pins, and sometimes they do, they're being comforted. They're being strengthened. They're being helped to face the facts and come out a stronger person. And those who've learned to mourn will come out strong. Funnily enough, in Britain, tears are regarded as a sign of weakness. But according to our Lord's thinking, this kind of tear is a sign of strength of comforting from the Lord. Now we turn to number three. Meek. Said an Indian, Christ, an Indian Hindu to C.F. Andrews in the days of British imperialism, Sir, the Englishman may inherit the earth, but if you called him meek, he would be insulted. And that is the general reaction to the word meek. Let's say straight away it does not mean blessed are the weak, nor does it mean blessed are the mild. I don't like that word mild a bit. It's one of the things I'm not too happy about Charles Wesley, loving his hymns in every other respect. But he it was who put meek and mild together. Our Lord was not mild. The one who could whip money changers out of the temple was not mild, but he was meek. The word does not mean a feeble, frail person who's easily pushed around and easily knocked down. I don't think we should give that impression. 
It's a strong word. It is used of forces held in check. It was used by the Greeks of breaking in a horse. Now, I used to do that when I worked on the farm. And breaking in a horse is not trying to make it soft. It is seeking to control the energy there is there. And when it's broken in, all that energy is still there, it's still strong, but the energy is now channeled into useful purposes. It is now meek. It is not weak. It is meek. And it's still strong. Now that's why the, the meekest man in the Bible was Moses. Now, if the Bible didn't say that in Numbers 12, 3, would you ever have thought it? If I asked you who was the strongest man in the Bible, you'd say Samson. You'd be wrong, of course. He was the weakest. If I asked you who was the wisest man in the Bible, you'd say Solomon. But he wasn't. He was one of the most foolish. A man who could have as many wives and concubines as that wasn't very wise. <laughs> and if I asked you who was the most meek man on earth, well, you'd have to say Moses because the Bible said so, but he wasn't. All of these people had to be supernaturally trained and molded before they were wise or strong or meek. But when I read the story of Moses, I wouldn't have thought of him as meek, would you? Yet he was. All the forces of his character were molded and held in check by God and used for good purposes. That's meekness. It's a man who's got himself completely in control and therefore doesn't react by instinct to what happens to him. We shall see much more of this tomorrow morning. I think, yes, tomorrow morning, later, where our Lord draws certain pictures of meekness. A man who's injured never thinks of revenge. A man who suffers injustice never thinks of his right. A man who's insulted never thinks of his reputation and that requires strength of character to be meek and not to hit back. Now the News Chronicle, as it used to be, held a competition once as to the most striking headline. Some of the entries were these. Income tax reduced to fourpence in the pound. The winner was Negro dope fiend slays preacher's mistress. That won the prize because it had everything in it. Sex, murder, color, dope, the lot. But one of the entries was, the meek shall inherit the earth next Wednesday. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> For the uh, ordinary Englishman's reaction to this is it's not true that if you hold yourself in check and don't assert your rights and stand for your reputation and take your revenge, you'll be pushed out. Life is a jungle and it doesn't work this way. But in fact, Jesus is saying it will work this way. It is, of course, a quotation from Psalm 37, verse 11, where it refers not to the earth but to the land of Canaan and where the people of God are assured that if they hold themselves in check, if they are meek, then they will be given the land of Canaan, but that if they try and grasp it by asserting themselves, they will lose it. Said a wealthy landowner to an artist painting in one of his fields, all this land is mine. And the artist replied, but the landscape is mine. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And it is literally true that God will one day give the whole earth to those who didn't try and grasp it, but to those who are fit to have it. Paul was able to say, as having nothing yet possessing all things, all things are yours because you are Christ. That is literally true and will one day be seen to be true. Hungry and thirsty are two words that we do not understand. I've never been hungry in my life. I've had a good appetite. I've been without a meal or two, but I've never been hungry, as many people in the world are hungry, with that gnawing pain which dominates all else. I have once been thirsty. I was once stuck in the Arabian desert with a broken down Land Rover and no water. And I began to realize what thirsty is after a bit. You begin to think of a glass of water in your mind. 
begin to roll your tongue round your lips and begin to wonder what it feels like to drink water again. Now written in the Middle East, the words hungry and thirsty mean things which you and I do not understand. They mean to be so desperate for something that all else is excluded from your desire. Blessed are those who are desperate for righteousness is our next beatitude. A consuming passion, a grand desire, an overall ambition. Now the world's hunger and thirst is for happiness. Happiness here and holiness hereafter is if there is a hereafter. That is the world's priority. But the Christian's approach is precisely the opposite. Holiness here and happiness hereafter he knows is God's plan. Happiness is a byproduct of holiness. Holiness being defined in both a negative and a positive way. Negative to be free from self, free from sin, free from temper, free from envy, free from malice, free from jealousy, free from impatience, but not just free of those things because a life that is empty is filled with far worse spirits, but full of love, joy and peace toward God, patience, kindness and goodness towards others, and faithfulness, meekness and self-control towards self. This is holiness. The word holiness is musty to some people. It is monastic to others. But to us who know Jesus Christ, it's a lovely word. It means to be like him. Now I ask you this morning, in the center of these Beatitudes, is that your grand passion? May I put it like this? Everyone in this chapel this morning is exactly as holy as they really want to be. Because the promise here is that this is one thing that you may have because it's the one thing God wants to give you. How hungry are you for it? If you're hungry, he'll satisfy you. And that means that I'm just as holy as I really want to be, no more, no less. Is not the prayer upon most of our lips, in fact, Lord, make me holy, but not just yet. We'd love to be a saint, but we'd not like to be all that rec is required in a saint. I heard a man say that his ambition was to be an ex-missionary. Do you understand that? Well, wouldn't it be nice to be an ex-saint? But there's an appetite for holy things that we've got to have. Do you covet it in others? Do you seek it in yourself? Do you take time to be holy? then you will be because you are satisfied God will fill those who are desperate to be like Christ the next beatitude is to be merciful now at this point we run into those who say this is not a beatitude it's a bargain and therefore it belongs to salvation by works now it is not a bargain with men and it is not a bargain with God there is no guarantee that if I show mercy to men, that they will show mercy to me. The world isn't like that. Nor is it a bargain with God, as if there is a pact of mutual lenience between us. You do this and I'll do that. This is not the meaning of the Beatitude. That would contradict the whole of the Gospel, which is not a bargain or a contract. It is a covenant freely entered into by God through his grace. Well, what does it mean? We know what showing mercy does, means from Luke 10, where the parable of the Good Samaritan defines it for us, he that showed mercy. It is first of all a thing of the heart. It is to feel compassion for another in need. It is secondly a thing of the will. It is to do something about that need and to express the compassion by binding up his wounds, setting him on an ass and paying the innkeeper tuppence for his keep. But it is primarily a thing of the mind. The whole point of the Good Samaritan is that it was a Samaritan. And there was as deep a color bar between the Jews and the Samaritans as has ever existed today. There was a racial gulf between them. And they were not even on speaking terms. Do you know why the Jew was going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho to avoid going through Samaria? 
it was the long way round to Galilee and he was deliberately going down that road to avoid meeting a Samaritan. That's the setting and that's the point of the story. And though two Jews, a priest and a Levite, went past, it was the Samaritan traveller who stopped. Now let me make this up to date. In a gold mine in Johannesburg, one of the overseers, a white man, was trapped underground. And so dangerous was the condition of the gallery in which he was trapped that no one went in to fetch him out. Until an African, at risk of his life, crawled in and pulled that man out to safety. The man was unconscious, taken into hospital, but he recovered. Now, when he recovered, they told him that but for this man's courage, he wouldn't be alive. And the man said, I'd love to meet him. Bring him in, please. And they brought in this man, and when the man in the bed saw the color of his skin, he turned over, wouldn't shake hands with him, and wouldn't speak to him. Now, supposing that European was again trapped in the mine, and supposing again someone was needed to go in, should or would that African go in a second time to save him, do you think? If he did, then that is showing mercy. For the very word mercy means that it is to do something that is not deserved. It's not just doing good deeds. The parable of the Good Samaritan was not told us simply to do good deeds. It was to do good deeds particularly to the enemy, particularly to the undeserving. And the Samaritan showed mercy to the one who fell among the thieves. Because the Samaritan knew that the Jew would probably not even bother to thank him and would still despise him. Blessed is he that showeth mercy. Why? Because he shall obtain mercy. What does that mean? I think it means first that this quality of mercy which is not strained, I find it is strained, often to breaking point, which falleth as the gentle dew of heaven, this quality of mercy is a quality that especially appeals to God's heart. And the reward, in a sense, is twofold. I do believe that our fellowship with God and our forgiveness which we need daily for the daily sins we commit is conditioned by our passing on that forgiveness. That we are taught in the Lord's Prayer forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them. This is not for purpose of salvation but for that daily communion with the Lord. As needed as our daily bread, our daily food is our daily forgiveness. And it is conditioned in so far as we pass on to others the mercy that we have received. And if we are not forgiving, then in that daily sense we cannot be forgiven. The two go together. And if my heart is refusing mercy to another, how can I come for that daily forgiveness which I need for communion? The parable of the debtors tells the same story. But in the future, it seems to me to suggest that just as there is a reward in heaven for all Christian service, there is a place in the Christian life for reward. We shall be judged not for purposes of punishment, but for purposes of reward. There is, as it were, an undeserved reward, a reward out of proportion for those who have shown mercy because, because this quality is particularly precious in God's sight and the reward for showing mercy in Christian service will be even more than is deserved and will be a particular example of God's mercy itself. It seems that this quality is nearer to God's heart than many others. I'll leave those thoughts with you. We could therefore reverse the beatitude because this will give us the secret of being merciful. Blessed are those who obtain mercy, for they shall be merciful. That's where it starts. It is only when you've got a living sense of the sheer undeserved favor of God that you can show this to someone else. Look at the hymns, look at the texts that spring to mind. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. You've just sung, His mercies are new every morning. It's a mercy that we're here this morning. It's a mercy that the sun is shining. It's a mercy that we've got enough to eat and enough to wear. It's a sheer mercy. Do you deserve this? 
You deserve to be here reading the word of God this morning. It's a mercy. As new every morning as the paper. Tis mercy all immense and free. God be merciful to me a sinner. When you think like that you can show mercy to others. And as you show mercy to others more mercy flows into you. And a virtuous circle goes on turning. Number six. Blessed are the pure in heart. Sin blinds and it is a mercy that it does for if the sinner looked at God and could see God he'd shrivel up eternal light eternal light how pure the soul must be when placed within thy searching sight it shrinks not but with calm delight can live and look on thee it's a wonderful hymn that a sinner couldn't look at God there is a holiness without which no man can see the Lord. Blessed are the pure. Now there are three things told us in this beatitude. Two rather of our religion. First of all it is a religion of the heart. Let's get that quite clear. It is not something that we put on outside. That is a whited sepulchre. It is something that begins within. After all sin is of the heart. As a man thinketh in his heart so is he. After all, the heart is the source of dirt. What makes a man dirty is not what he puts into his mouth, but what proceeds out of his heart, every evil thought. Fornications, adulteries come out of a man's heart. After all, the heart is the part of us which God will judge. For man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord doesn't see as man sees. The Lord looks on the heart. It is the heart that first responds to the gospel. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And it is in the heart that true worship takes place. This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The heart. Now, of course, with us, we have changed the meaning of the word. It doesn't mean, of course, the physical organ which pumps blood. It doesn't mean the seat of the emotions in the Bible. It has come to mean that with us. But the word heart in the Bible means quite simply the inside of a man. It would cover what we call heart, mind and will. Our emotions, our thoughts and our motives. It means the inside and we use the word sometimes like this when we say now the heart of the problem, we mean the real inside of it. That's the true meaning of the word heart in scripture. Not your emotions, but the real inside of you. The second thing that this tells us about religion, it's not only a religion of the heart, it's a religion of purity. Clean hearts. I discern a kind of progression in scripture here. The law in Leviticus seems to place tremendous emphasis on clean hands. Then in the Psalms, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Then we come through to the gospel and Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. And he was criticized because he let his disciples eat with unclean hands. There is a kind of progression here. And the heart of it is a clean heart. Now what does a clean heart mean? First, it means a heart that is free from mixed motives. A heart that is single, that is not double-minded, that is not half-hearted, but a pure motive that desires God for his own sake. And the second thing, of course, it means a heart that is free from dirty desires, mm -hmm. that spoil even the holiest thing we do. And those people will see God. They can see him better even here. I remember a man who was as rough a man as I've ever met before he knew Christ. He never looked at nature. He always saw nature through the steamy window of a pub parlor. And yet I went to walk with Jimmy Gilliland in County Durham after his conversion. And you know every blade of grass, every cloud in the sky, every leaf on the tree spoke to him of God. You could see God everywhere. A man who'd never bothered to look at nature before. He was now pure in heart. There was a little boy who said to his daddy, 
Daddy, have you ever seen God? And his daddy said, now don't trouble me with questions like that. Off you go away and play. So he went out into the street and he saw a man coming down the road with a dog collar on. So he went up to him and he said, have you ever seen God? Well, now that's a big question from a little boy. Uh, I'll tell you when you're a bit older. So he went on down and he found a dear saint sitting by a river. And he said to this dear old man, have you ever seen God? And the old man lifted his eyes and he looked around. Then he looked down into the little boy's face and then he said, sometimes lad I think I sees nothing else. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. And one day they will have a vision of God, direct, face to face, no longer through a mirror, obscurely, but then face to face, no longer through the mirror of the Bible, the mirror of nature, the mirror of saints, but face to face. This beatitude seems to suggest that what we see then will be determined by how holy we've been here. There seems to be some suggestion that we'll see more of God if we've been pure in heart. So we move on to number seven. Blessed are the peacemakers. There's a tremendous need for peace in the world which I don't need to underline. International peace. Do you know that a historian has worked out we've only had 300 years of peace in the last 4,000 years? Isn't that an amazing figure? Britain has been engaged in 78 wars through history, minor and major, cold and hot. Racial peace, industrial peace, ecclesiastical peace, domestic peace, 50,000 divorces a year. Personal peace, what H.G. Wells said of Mr. Polly is true of most of us. He was not so much a human being as a civil war. Peace. But it does not say blessed are the placid. I find some people who are always at peace because they have a lovely placid temperament. How I envy them. They seem to just sail through life so delightfully. It's not blessed are the placid. Nor is it blessed are the popular. Everybody is your friend. Nor is it blessed is the pacifist. I don't think that's going deep enough into this beatitude. Nor is it blessed are the politicians, though they desperately try to make peace. Nor is it blessed are the peace lovers, who like peace at any price. It's blessed are the peacemakers. And that may mean that you are regarded as precisely the opposite. Jeremiah was when the false prophets cried, peace, peace, Jeremiah said there is no peace. Isaiah said there's no peace for the wicked. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace but a sword. The peacemakers will often be thought of as just the opposite. These that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. Of course, they were quite wrong. They were turning the world right way up. But if you're living upside down, all of you, and somebody comes along who's right way up, Einstein's theory of relativity means that you regard them as turning you upside down. <coughs> And this is how peacemakers are often regarded. Who then are the peacemakers? It is not those who keep the fighters apart and enable them to live in peaceful coexistence. It is those who come with a ministry of reconciliation and who base it upon atonement. Therefore the first peacemakers are the evangelists. Wherever a man pleads with men on behalf of God to be reconciled to him through Christ, there is a peacemaker. He may not be regarded as that, but he's a peacemaker. Blessed are the evangelists, the peacemakers of the world. Not only those who announce the peace that the blood of his cross has bought, but the pastors are peacemakers. For there is not only peace needed to be reconciled between God and men, but to be reconciled as men with men, as Christian with fellow Christian, and some Christians have a unique ministry of peacemaking in this regard. After all, such people will be recognized as sons of the God of peace. And now the final one. One of the rarely praised virtues of Jesus is his honesty. He was absolutely honest. He didn't tell people it was a bed of roses. He said it'll be a crown of thorns. He didn't offer people a cushion but a cross. He didn't call them to a picnic but a battle. I am very disturbed both by preachers and testimonies that imply the opposite. I've had more trouble since I became a Christian than I ever had before and so have you. Christ said in the world you will have troubles, tribulation, same word. And the word tribulation comes from tribulus which was a threshing sledge. 
You'll go under. You'll be thrashed in life. And Jesus was honest. He didn't promise an easy life. So never preach that if you come to Christ, your troubles are over. That's a lie anyway. I heard a testimony at a youth rally on Saturday evening from a girl who'd been converted one month. And she said, I've been wonderfully happy for a month. All my problems have been solved. All my troubles are over. I felt like saying, just you wait, sister. <laughs> just you wait. But she'd been led to believe by the one who led her to Christ that that is what she ought to expect. But Jesus never said that. He said, if you follow me, you'll be hated because I am. If you follow me, you'll have to carry a cross every day. If you follow me, you'll be persecuted. If you follow me, you'll have a tough time. He promised them a cross before he promised them a crown. And Jesus was absolutely honest with would-be disciples. If you follow me, you might have nowhere to lay your head. If you follow me, you'll have to give up everything. You'll have to get rid of your money, you rich young man. He was honest. And here he says, you'll be persecuted. Now why? Now some of us are persecuted because we're offensive. We've got to be honest here because we have the wrong way of doing and saying things. There's no blessedness in that. But even if you're a saint, you'll be persecuted for two reasons. First, because you're a peacemaker and people don't like peacemakers. Secondly, because of Beatitudes 1 to 7, whoever would live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted because you're different. You're the conscience of mankind. You're the different person who disturbs. Your standards are so much higher. And they, because they are in a state of enmity against God, will have the same enmity to God's people. What explains, other than this, the anti-Semitism, which has been the characteristic of every race, including the British, where Jews have settled? It is because man is in rebellion against God. And the nearer you are to God, the nearer you share in that antagonism. But Jesus says, isn't it wonderful to be persecuted? Do you know, on the title page of John Bunyan's autobiography, this text is written, whoever would live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And did that man understand that? But it's a blessed state. Oh, how happy when you're persecuted, when people gossip about you, when they speak against you. <laughs> now, is that true? Yes, it is. First of all, because it's reassuring you belong to God. There are two things proved to you that you're one of God's people. First, that you love the brethren, and secondly, that the world hates you. It's reassuring. Secondly, it's refining. The church is never so strong as when it's persecuted. And a Christian is never so near his Lord. Do you remember when that pastor and his seven baptized converts, was it in Tibet or Nepal, were put into prison? There was a prayer meeting in an Indian church for them in prison. And one after another prayed, Lord, keep them safe. Lord, set them free from prison. Lord, bring them back to us. But as they prayed round the circle, they came to a dear Indian woman who got up and said, Lord, why did you give them the privilege of going to prison for you and not us? Why can't we suffer for you? The whole prayer meeting changed. Here was the first person in the prayer meeting who regarded it as a blessed experience. Persecution. And the others felt a little embarrassed at their prayers. And so this beatitude is not only reassuring, it's refining, it's rewarding. There is a special crown for the martyr. You spend your future with those who suffered before you, the prophets. And this beatitude came true in both parts. From the very beginning of the Acts, the disciples suffered and rejoiced that they were worthy to suffer for his name. And so finally, verse 13. The influence of this kind of character is described as salt. The last beatitude said what the world will do to us. Now, Jesus tells us what we will do to the world. We shall be salt. Now, I've heard many sermons on this. I've preached a few. But I've usually got the meaning a little wrong. I've usually thought first of the nice flavor that salt gives to anything else. But that's not what Jesus meant. Then I've talked about salt being a preservative. But that's not what Jesus meant. 
elsewhere Jesus described the two things he had in mind he said if the salt loses its savor it is thenceforth good neither for the dunghill nor the field the dunghill was of course the ordinary backyard primitive sanitation of those days it was the earth closet and salt was used as a disinfectant on the dunghill to stop infection spreading and the other use because the salt contained potash and other helpful elements scraped as it was from the shores of the dead sea was as a fertilizer in the field to make things grow in the barren soil now these are the two functions of salt in our lord's mind to discourage the growth of evil and dangerous things and to encourage the growth of good things to act as a disinfectant and a fertilizer that's what this kind of character outlined in the Beatitudes will do and that is a lovely thought that the Christian is the disinfectant and the fertilizer in this dirty and barren world discouraging evil things in spreading and encouraging good things to grow and it doesn't take a lot of salt to have an influence salt's influence is out of all proportion to its quantity but it is in proportion to its quality and therefore it must not lose its savor as a little bit of a scientist I used to wonder how can salt NACL lose its savor it's chemically impossible now I know that Jesus was right after all it lost its savor not by changing its substance but by being adulterated with other substances and a man who wanted to make money on the market would mix a bit of sand in with his salt and sell it at the same price and the more he mixed in of other things the more worthless it was and a housewife would buy some she'd taste it she realized that it was adulterated and since she hadn't a dustbin but as in this day you can see in the main street in Nazareth an open sewer down the middle of the street she would throw it out of the front door and it would be trodden under foot of men adulterated salt is no use the worldly Christian is no use to the world he neither acts as a disinfectant nor a fertilizer and even men despise and reject a worldly Christian whose character is not different I have noticed this a Christian is really different will be persecuted by others and respected by them and when they are in trouble it's to the Christian is different that they will go they despise the Christian who tries to be worldly and so salt is out of proportion to its quantity but in proportion to its quality in its influence on the world and there we must leave our study for this morning